So here's what we're going to be thinking about today. Here, so here's the, uh, some of you see, I put the sermon message titles out on social media. Uh, cursing fig trees, moving mountains, praying with faith. We're going to look at this very strange account of Jesus cursing a fig tree and then talking to his disciples about it. It's very like, his disciples are like, what? <laughs> what, what is going on here? We're going to look at this account and see some deep truths. It's just, it's just a few sentences long, but we're going to see some deep truths in this account of Jesus cursing a fig tree and then talking about moving mountains and praying with faith. So let's go to the Gospel of Matthew here. This is now on a Monday morning. It's the last week of Jesus' earthly life. He had come down to Jerusalem on Sunday, the day we call Palm Sunday, the city of Jerusalem was jam-packed. Usually the population at that time was about 150,000, but it was the Passover, the biggest of the Israelite holidays, and it's estimated there were probably a million and a half people in the city. So obviously they couldn't all stay in the city overnight. Jesus and his disciples are camping out just to the east of the city. The Mount of Olives, they called it a mountain. We'd probably call it a big hill, right? It was just to the east. They're camping out somewhere probably over the on the east side of that mountain. Now they're coming back into the city. And as they're coming, walking into the city, so Jesus, his 12 disciples, and that, by the way, if that sounds weird, I mean, they, they were together like for three straight years. But that's what rabbis or teachers of the word of God did in those days. They didn't have colleges. You know, I went to sem college and then seminary. They didn't have all that. So a rabbi would choose persons to be his disciples, and they would travel with him, a rabbi wouldn't have one synagogue that they stayed at. It would be like today if a church didn't have a pastor, but there was every week a different pastor, so that every week there was a different rabbi teaching, so the disciples would travel together. Now, the rabbis of the time would always pick the best and the brightest, right? Jesus picked what would appear to be the least likely people to be his disciples. But he was looking not at credentials, he was looking into hearts. So he's and his 12 disciples now are coming back up over the Mount of Olives. They're heading back toward the city. So in the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Now, we have to remember, they were dirt poor. Dirt, dirt, poor. That's what we, we get misled many times by the paintings with his perfectly snow-white robe, his perfectly combed hair, all of that. They were dirt, dirt, dirt poor, taxed to death by the Romans, right? Jesus would have grown up many times going to bed hungry at night. So they're coming back, they're returning to the city, he became hungry, so at verse 19. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside. So Lisa and I have a, a fig tree to the side. It's, it looks, we would call it more like, it looks like a bush, but technically it's, it's a tree. And this thing just grows. We, we could cut it all the way back down to the ground and it's massive again by the next year. So seeing a fig tree, that was the staple of their food. By the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. It looked good, was filled with leaves. Man, our fig tree, it just, it's filled with leaves, but there's no figs on it. Found nothing on it but only leaves. It looked good, but no fruit. And he said to it, here, he curses a fig tree. May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. It, it just withers and dies as soon as Jesus speaks those words. Now, we look at that and we say, what is going on? Why would he curse a fig tree? I am strongly of the opinion that he was aiming at something else. I am strongly of the opinion, and I am joined in this opinion by many others, <laughs> That what he was talking about is the kind of trees that might, quote, trees that might grow inside of us that bear no good fruit. Do you have a tree of anger growing in your heart? Now, we're hungry, right? He was hungry. What are we hungry for? We're hungry for peace. We're hungry for joy. We're hungry for love. We're hungry for all these good things in our lives. But there are these trees that start to grow within us that bear no good fruit. And so perhaps you have a tree of anger growing 
in your heart. You've heard me talk an awful lot about anger lately. Why? Because we have a nation and we have, in fact, a world right now where we are at a very angry point in the history of this nation and the history of this world. The, the, the amount of anger in this land right now is very concerning, right? Obviously. Now, the Bible says the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. This tree is bearing no good fruit. You have this anger kind of growing in your heart like a tree. What did Jesus do with that tree that was bearing no good fruit? He put it to death. He put it to death. If you have a tree growing that's producing no good fruit or maybe producing bad fruit in your life, put it to death. Put it to death. That's what the Bible says. Look in Paul's letter to the Colossians. We'll come back to Matthew. Here's Paul. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you. What does he mean, earthly? Those things that come from the way the world, when it turns its back on God, thinks. So yeah, the anger of man is earthly. It does not work the righteousness of God. So what does Paul say? Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. You know, if, if you have a whole lot of plants growing up in a garden, but you don't have the plants that you want growing up in that garden, you've got to clear out the other plants, right? You've got to take them out. And so here's Paul, here's the Lord saying to us, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And he gives us some lists here. He starts off with sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire. Oh, my heart is breaking for the children and the youth of our culture, where click, click, boom, there it is. Hardcore, despicable, disgusting, violent pornography right there. I'm so thankful that my son and his wife, as they're raising their children, are keeping their children away from all that, except, you know, they're walking home from school, and a friend comes up, my little grandson Luke one day, when he was in first grade, he comes home, he's, no, he gets off the school bus, his mom's waiting for him, he's crying, because some kid on the bus said, hey, look at this, and it was some violent, horrible thing, right? Here's God saying, put that to death, put it to death. Put it to death. Do you know what the sociologists are telling us about the amount of time the average male in America is spending looking at porn on the phone? Here's Paul saying, don't mess around with us. It's producing no good fruit. You will not have the trees that will produce good fruit grown if you allow this to crowd them out. Put it to death. And he goes on then, covetousness, wanting what others have, greed. Right? That word's very closely related to greed, which is idolatry. What does the Bible say? The love of money is the root of all evil. I used to think that was an exaggeration. The love of money is the root of all evil. I don't think it's an exaggeration anymore. Put it to death, Paul says. Put, why, why put it to death? Because, hey, you know, I am so thankful. I was telling the uh, congregation last night, uh, I am just blown away by, uh, by you all. Uh, we have a team getting ready to go over to our orphanage right, in Namibia, southern Africa, in a couple of weeks. And so we've been operating this uh, orphan, orphan care. So it's not just the residential care for 50 or 60 children at any time, but it's also feeding hundreds of other children in the region. You all have given millions of dollars since 2003 to do this. But you know, if I have a tree of covetousness, wanting stuff that other people have, I am far less likely to open my hand, as the Bible says, freely to the poor and needy. And so Jesus says, Put that to death. It's idolatry. You're making stuff. You're making money. You're making your things. God. Ooh, I'm so grateful for a congregation who has been so incredibly generous that these children, generations now of children, can be blessed and blessed. Right? So at verse 6 then, he goes on, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. If I allow that tree that's producing no fruit and therefore crowding out the possibility of any good fruit in my life, or I allow that tree that's producing bad fruit to grow and grow, well, on account of this, the wrath of God is coming. Now, when we see that phrase, the wrath of God, we say, what? God is love. That's what the Bible says. We get mixed up because all we can think is the wrath of man. All we can think about is human wrath, human anger. The wrath of God is perfect justice. That's what the wrath of God is. I got all kinds of stuff. 
my brother and my sisters are starving to death and I give them nothing, there will be justice. There will be justice. And so he's saying, put to death, here's God saying, put to death those trees bearing no good fruit. The justice of God is coming. So at verse 7 then, what does he say? In these you too once walked. That's how you were living. That's all that was happening in your life when you were living in them. So at verse 8, he gives us another list here. He says, but now you must put them all away. Anger, there it is. Put it away. Put that to death. He doesn't say, you know, just kind of work on it. He says, put it to death. Put it to death. Wrath, malice, in other words, bad intent towards others. Slandering, lying about other persons. You know, the Bible says that lying lips are an abomination to God. The Bible also says that all persons are liars. Look it up in the book of Romans. And so what's that telling us? When I realize I have this tree of dishonesty growing in my heart. What did Jesus say, by the way? Every word that comes out of your mouth comes from your heart. So if I hear words of dishonesty coming out of my mouth, that means there's a place of dishonesty. There's a tree of dishonesty growing in my heart. And here's God saying, put it to death. Put it to death. Slander, lying about people, obscene talk. Phew, wow. We're bombarded. Media, a saturated society, we're bombarded by all this trash talk, all this obscene talk. God's saying, put it out. Put it to death. It bears no good fruit. It's crowding out. Crowding. I had someone just broken hearted, this foul, foul talk coming out of her mouth, and before she knew it, it was coming out of her mouth directed at God. And so here's Jesus saying, put it, put it, put it to death. Let's look at Paul's uh, letter to the Romans here. Now, here's the thing. Now, if we have died with Christ, so if I put these things to death, if I say, okay, Jesus cursed that fig tree so we would know to curse those things bearing no good fruit in our lives. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. So if we put these things to death, then he will produce life within us. He'll produce, produce the trees, right, that bring the good fruit, which is life. What do he say? I give you life in abundance, abundant life I will give to you. So this isn't just for the reason of don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. No, don't do these things. Put these things to death so that the power of Jesus can produce the good fruit that he desires in your life. Who do we ever need? My heart is breaking for our children, for the youth of this land. Do they ever need us more than ever right now? Right? Everybody was kind of isolated, right, for a few years. That means the phone, the phone, the phone, the phone, the phone. Lie, 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 lie. They need you and me. They need you and me filled with the goodness of Jesus, filled with the love of Jesus, filled with the kindness and the compassion of Jesus. This angry nation all around us that is rapidly heading to something not good desperately needs you and me to have the goodness of Jesus growing in our lives, to have those good fruits of Jesus in abundance in our lives. So we believe if we put these things to death, we believe we will also live with him. So look in Galatians here. So the fruit of the Spirit. So Jesus said, I'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit, what the the Spirit of God now within you will produce, here it is, love, joy, peace, patience. These are the things we actually hunger for. Right? You know, you you can actually hunger for the good food, right? But satisfy for a little while your appetite with the junk food, right? But the things we're actually hungering for, the things that God created us to have in our lives, if we put to death those trees of bad fruit or no fruit, then these things can grow. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. Wow. Patience. Kindness goodness. Isn't it pathetic that the simple statement, be kind, is now a political statement? What? What? Be kind. This is the kindness of God. Goodness. Faithfulness. Goodness. We might say integrity. The goodness of God. Put these things to death so that the good fruit of the Spirit will grow in your life. At verse 23, gentleness, self-control, Gentleness. You know, I've had people say gentleness. Come on, really? Yeah, really, there it is in God's word. Gentleness. Self-control. Against such things, there's no law. Nothing can stop. 
Nothing can stop. We do what we do, which is put to death the trees of bad fruit or no fruit in our lives. And then nothing can stop what God seeks to produce within us. So at verse 24, right? Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. We put to death. When he says flesh, he means a worldly way of thinking. Crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So the first thing in this story, him cursing a fig tree is telling us to put to death that which is not producing good fruit in our lives. So let's go back to Matthew and see what happens next. So you remember when he spoke to that tree, immediately it withered. So when the disciples saw it, they marveled. They were amazed, saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? And by the way, a little parenthesis here, the Gospel of Mark, so another biography of Jesus, records that when they came back then the next day, so when they come back Tuesday morning, again, Peter's looking at that withered tree and again asking Jesus all these questions. But here Matthew tells us that when they first even saw it, right, they're like, how did this, how did this happen? How did that tree wither at once? So at verse 21 then, and Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, so I'm guessing they're standing on that Mount of Olives, right? They're looking over the city of Jerusalem. Even if you say to this mountain, which was about, by the way, 50, I think, 50 miles or so from the, Med maybe it's 40 miles from the Mediterranean Sea. Even if you say to this mountain, let's, let's put the, the, right there, underlined. Say, even if you say to this mountain, he was talked to the fig tree. Now, even if you say to this mountain, be taken up, and thrown into the sea, it will happen. Now, you know, I used to think, oh, come on, really, Jesus? Maybe this is hyperbole. You know what that word means? It means you, you're trying to make a point, so you kind of exaggerate it. You overstate it. Except that I believe every word of God literally, right? Every, what does it say in Proverbs 30? Every word of God proves true. Here's Jesus saying, even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen if you have faith and do not doubt. So we're asking this question now, how do you put those trees that are growing inside of you with no good fruit, how do you put them to death? Or how do you move this mountain out of the way? This mountain of impossibility, quote, right, that's standing in front of you, how do you move it out of your way? With your words. With your words. I mean, that's what he did. He spoke to the tree, it withered. He wasn't praying to the Father. He spoke to the tree, it withered. He said, and if you say to this mountain, be taken up, thrown into the sea, it will happen. With your words. What is this all about? Words of faith and not doubt. Look in Proverbs here, chapter 18. You know this scripture. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, in the power of the words you speak. You know there have been those persons who have spoken death into you, right? Maybe you were coming up and some important person in your life was telling you, you're, you're such a failure, you're such a loser, you'll never, you'll never get it. They were speaking death. I, I met someone one time, he, he came to Jesus, but he would never sing. Right, we're singing God's praise. He would never sing. He would never sing. Because when he was a, a kid, he was told by a, a choir director one time, uh, you keep your mouth, you just move your, your, your lips, but don't sing because you can't sing. Wow. We, you've, you've had people speak death into you, right? You've had people speak life into you. Somebody saying, wow, that was awesome. Thank, you are amazing. That was incredible, right? You've had people speak death into you and life into you. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, the words we speak. Those who love it, those who know that, those who will believe God will eat its fruits. So how do we put to death that tree that's bearing no good fruit? How do we move that mountain of impossibility in front of us? With the words that come out of our mouths. You say, now, wait a minute. Come on, Pastor Craig. Wait, wait. Okay, let's look here in the book of Philippians. You know this scripture, right? So if I'm driving down the road and out of my mouth comes, Craig, you are so stupid. You'll never be able to do this. You can't do this. You can't. You'll never. You're too weak, Craig. You can't do it. Every word that comes out of your mouth comes from your heart. So what do you do? You say out loud, I can do all things through him who strengthened me. That's a word of faith right there. 
because it's the word of God. Or maybe you didn't hear it come out of your mouth, right? But in your head was rattling these thoughts. I'm too weak. I can't do this. I'll never get it. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Man, the people who finally brought about the end of the wickedness of slavery in this nation, whoa, what came against them? And I guarantee you they were saying to themselves over and over again, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens you. You put to death then that tree of I can't, I can't, I can't by a word of faith. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Right? You speak it out loud. You hear it with your ears. You keep speaking it out loud. You hear it with your ears. What, the word of God is powerful. What does the Bible say? The word of God is the sword of the spirit. It's the Spirit of God taking the truth of the Word of God and cutting down those trees that need to go because it's the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Let's go to the book of Psalms here, Psalm 27. So if I'm saying, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I, 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 I don't know what's going to happen, I don't know what they'll do, I don't know what they'll think, I'm afraid I'm going to fail again. No, I'm thinking all that mess, right? That's the tree of, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, the tree of fear growing. Then you say out loud, the Lord is the, my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? I will not be afraid because the Lord is the stronghold of my life. You speak with your words, words of faith, not doubt. You speak with your words, words of faith, and they put to death because the word of God is the sword of the spirit, putting to death those trees that are bearing bad fruit in your life, right? You speak to that mountain that's in front of you. What's that mountain of impossibility that's in front of you? What are the mountains of impossibility in front of us in our nation? What are the mountains of impossibility that are in front of us in this world? We don't say it's impossible. No, we say the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I be afraid? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And the mountains go. The mountains go. Right? Our hearts are like computers. Whatever information you put in, that's what they'll spit out. Right? And so we put in and put in. And you've heard me say many times what a change it was when I learned finally to pray out loud, when I learned to read the word of God out loud. And I don't know if that's just my personality or what, but all I know is that everybody read the word of God out loud in Jesus' day. They didn't pray silently. They didn't read the Bible silently. That wasn't a thing until much later in history. You say it out loud so that your ears hear it, so it sinks into your heart. Or maybe it's just my adult onset ADHD. I don't know. But I'm reading silently, and my brain is going in a thousand directions. But I'm reading the Word of God out loud. It focuses my brain, and I'm hearing it and hearing it and hearing it. Because I need God to put those things to death that start growing in my heart. I need God to put that anger to death. I need God to put that fear to death. I need God to put that doubt to death. And so I start speaking the Word of God. Speaking the word of God. Look in 1 John here, chapter 4. So, right, when you say, some of you baby boomers like me, you remember that comedian, Flip Wilson, remember his little thing? The devil made me do it, the devil made me do it, the devil made me do it. So we might say, the devil's beating me up, the devil's just beating me up, the devil's just beating me up. They felt like the devil was beating them up because everyone around them was acting like the devil, right? No. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you, the Spirit of God is greater than he, the devil, who is in the world. So when that, 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 that tree of saying the devil's going to win, wickedness is going to win, evil is going to win, uh, it, uh, uh, you can't fight City Hall, right? There's too many of them. The devil is just beating me up. No, you speak truth. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And you put that tree of bad fruit to death. You put it to death. Uh, let's uh, go here to letter to the Romans, right? So that, that tree of shame, that tree of failure. I am such a loser. I am such a failure. I am so ashamed of myself. I am so ashamed of myself. That's a tree producing no good fruit at all. No good fruit at all. One time I heard somebody, this is 
30 years ago or something, heard somebody on a, a talk show say, well, I'm going to hell anyway, and yeah, you conclude that? You conclude you're a failure in God's eyes? You conclude you're going to hell anyway? Yeah, that's a tree producing really bad fruit. No, then you say, with your lips, you put that to death by speaking the word of God. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You're putting that tree of shame, that tree of failure to death. What does the Bible say? Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. All the more. That's why we don't judge people. That's why Jesus said, don't judge. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. That person I'm tempted to judge is the very person that Jesus is going to bring to himself next. Right? So we put these trees to death. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Move those mountains. Put those trees to death with the words that you speak, words of faith, the word of God. You'll put them to death. Now there's one more thing that Jesus says, so let's go back to Matthew now. So he, he, he talks about talking to that tree, talking to that mountain, and then he says, and whatever you ask in prayer, talking to God talking to our Heavenly Father. You will receive if you have faith. You will receive if you have faith. So when I was a younger pastor, I, I would like look at verses like this, and I, I didn't want to quote them to people. I didn't want to quote, I mean, I did, but I didn't, because I didn't want people to like just get totally crushed when something they were praying for, some loved one they were praying for, and then the prayer didn't seem like it was answered, and, and I was thinking like people are just going to like just feel so, like, so bad, it was my lack of faith, it was my lack of faith, my lack of faith. But you know what? And I felt I was being, like, really compassionate. But you can't find somebody more compassionate than Jesus. You can't find in all of history anyone more compassionate. It's not like Jesus was speaking some word here that wasn't compassionate. Because it was Jesus who had compassion for the, the outcasts, the most judged, the condemned, right? The blind beggars by the side of the road that everyone else just ignored. The woman caught in adultery, right? The prostitute they threw in front of him, one to stone her to death. It was Jesus who spoke great compassion. So I finally was like, okay, Craig, you think you're being so compassionate because you don't want to hurt anybody. But this is the word of God. It's truth. Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Now, if I ask God, please help me to rob the Walgreen down on the corner here. I don't think he's going to grant that request, is he? So we read in 1 John, if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us, and if he hears us, he will grant our request. But what do I, we know is according to his will? Anything that's in the word of God, right? So we pray, and we will receive if we have faith. We don't pray contrary to the word of God. We will receive if we have faith. So, so here's the question that I want to ask. How do you keep faith? How do you keep praying with faith? I can keep quoting the word of God and putting to death these things. But I need more than me quoting the word of God. I need God helping me. If I, need mount, if I want mountains to move, if I want things put to death in my life, I need God helping me. So Jesus said, whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. God, I'm, I'm speaking your word, your word. I'm speaking your word, but God, this thing is still in me. It's still in me. And so Jesus said, now pray, pour out your heart with faith. Pour out your heart. But how do you keep faith? You pray, and you don't see anything happen. You pray, you don't see anything happen. How do you keep praying with faith? And so finally, let's look in the book of Romans here. So here, Paul's writing, and he's talking about that man, Abraham. Remember how God came to that man, Abraham, and said, Abraham, I'm going to do great things in your life. I'm going to use you in a powerful way. And in fact, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of a nation, the father of Israel, right? The first people that God began to relate to you. I'm going to make you to be a father of a nation, your descendants, your descendants will do great things in the history of this world. But Abraham was an old man when God came to him. He had no children. And the years started going by and going by and going by, and now he's about 100 years old. He still doesn't have any descendants. Now, this promise was huge for Abraham. It changed his whole life. He became a new person when God spoke to him and made these promises. But the years are going by and going by, and there doesn't seem to be any fulfillment, any faithfulness to the promise that, that God made to him. He still doesn't have any descendants. But look what Paul wrote about him. He said, Now no unbelief made him waver 
concerning the promise of God. Doubt didn't creep into his heart. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith. In fact, his faith got stronger and stronger as the years went by. Wait, we would say, well, wait a minute, the years are going by now, the clock is ticking, you're getting to be an old man, you're going to die soon, you still don't have the descendants he promised. He grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. How do you keep praying with faith? You keep praying with faith if you will keep on praising God. You will keep on thanking God. What does the Bible say? Give thanks in all circumstances. And then the Bible even says, give thanks for all things. You keep giving glory to God. You keep praising God. You keep singing his praise. You keep pouring your heart out in thanksgiving, right? And your faith stays strong because your eyes then aren't looking at the circumstances. If Abraham was looking at his body. If we had read a few verses before this, he said he, he, he looked like he was as good as dead, right? He was, he was, he's looking at the circumstances of life, he would have lost his faith, which meant then he would have stopped living this changed life that he was living as God had made those promises to him. But he kept giving glory to God. He kept praising God so that he was able to keep on praying with faith. You keep praying, give, praising God. So you're keeping your eyes on the goodness of God. You're keeping your eyes on who our God is. And it's keeping your faith strong. So at verse 21 then, he says, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Fully convinced. Keep on praising God. Look for those trees that are producing no good fruit. Put them to death. Speak to that mountain of impossibility that's in front of you or that's in front of all of us. Put it, move that mountain, put that tree to death by speaking the word of God, speaking the word of God, speaking the word of God so that your heart, your heart is transformed by the sword of the spirit, the word of God, taking out those trees that are producing death, bringing the fruit of the spirit to your life. And how do you keep praying and keep praying and keep praying? With faith, you keep on praising God. You know, we don't do music just because, yeah, you, you have to have, like, nice music to do something. We do music, and music, we sing, and we sing, and we sing. By the way, we got some worship nights coming up. We are, we are going to sing for a very long time. We'll start publicizing those soon, because the more you sing God's praise, the more you keep giving him glory, the stronger your faith gets, no matter what's going on in your life. No matter what's going on in your life, the stronger your faith gets. If you lose your faith, right, then you'll stay where you are. But if you keep your faith, because you keep singing God's praise, then you get the, that good fruit of courage, that good fruit of strength, that good fruit of determination, right? And you climb any mountain, you move any mountain out of the way. He's an awesome God. Hey, we're gonna sing this last song. I would invite you to come and pray here at this altar. Maybe you want to come up and just pour out your heart. You want to just praise God, whatever your prayer is. Maybe you want to come up here and put some tree to death. I would invite you to come here. Let's stand.